So welcome to the today's session. Today's session is on research life cycle, data management, and standards. I'm sure by the third day of the program, you're all getting a little jaded and then saying we are hearing the same words. There was research data life cycle yesterday and today we are talking about research life cycle. We are talking about the same RDM and also today we have introduced another standards. Well, as you know, at least by this time, RDM is a sub-discipline that has just emerged in the last couple of years. So thereby in the initial years, as it happens with any emergent discipline or sub-discipline, there will be certain overlaps. So that is why you will find this kind of a little overlap between some sessions, which cannot be avoided. That is to bring the whole thing into one common uh, platform. Now with this introduction about this session, let me now introduce and invite our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker today is Dr. A.J. Million, who is a research investigator at the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research at the University of Michigan, where he manages the National Archives for Criminal Justice data. His research examines public sector information technology use, scholarly communication, research data management, and public administration. He has been given grants, that is research grants, by the US Department of Justice, the National Science Foundation, Center for Disease Control, and the American Association of Universities. The reason why I made a special mention of these different things, particularly today, is to, as some of you have realized, because there has always been this kind of a Sometimes a misconception, I would say, when we say open science or scientific research, people think that it refers primarily to the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and medicine. But when we say open science, that's why some people use the word open research or open scholarship. It is inclusive. It includes social sciences and humanities. So that's why, I mean, that's how we have tried to bring in different uh, aspects of this open science. And we have with us today, Dr. Million, who is going to talk about his view and his work with uh, the research data that he is managing. Welcome, Million. How are you today? I know it is midnight there. It's actually past midnight in uh, where he is from. Okay, so let us respect and honor his time here and stick to our time. I know we are behind schedule. So over to you, AJ. So it's it's definitely an honor and a privilege to speak to you um, in your case this morning and in my case tonight. Um, and today, um, what I'm going to talk about is an ecology or an ecological view of the research data life cycle and open science specifically. So I know as academics, we often have very long, uh, complex titles um, to our papers, to our books, to the things that we talk about. And today, what I'll be talking about is not that much different, but basically what I'm really talking about today are some observations I have from my practice, my work at ICPSR about research data management, standards and data documentation. And I'm hoping to make some really practical arguments about the implications for open science. And by science, I mean STEM fields, but also the social sciences and other areas of empirical research. So just to tell you a little bit about me, I'm the director of the National Archive of Criminal Justice Data, which is an archive of crime data in the United States funded by the US Department of Justice and I work at ICPSR. Um, I, you already know a little bit about my research, and in the past, I've done a lot of things. I started my career as a librarian in transport. Um, I was an instructor at the University of Missouri where I earned my PhD, and then prior to, or after that, I was a research fellow at the School of Information at the University of Michigan. Now, 
most of what I'm going to talk about today centers on my unique role at ICPSR managing the National Archive of Criminal Justice data. And its mission is to support research on crime and justice by facilitating discovery and the use of data. And its audience is, well, just about everyone. We primarily serve the criminal justice research community in the US, but we also are open to uh, crime and justice researchers abroad as well. Um, we regularly receive queries from news organizations or non-academic research institutions, and we are funded by the United States government. Um, we actually manage, curate, process, and archive data sets on behalf of three federal agencies, so all crime and criminal justice research the national institute of justice research that the u.s government funds the data must be archived for public use um the same goes with this other institution and then we also support the bureau of justice statistics in providing national data uh, to the country as well so in a nutshell what we do is we receive data curate it disseminate it and support data users none of which should sh surprise you and you know we're a very large, long-standing archive at ICPSR. Um, I'm providing all of this to give you a background on where I'm coming from because I was originally trained as a librarian before I decided to go back to school and earn my PhD. And as time has gone by, I think it's given me a, a unique perspective on the role of data as it can contribute to scientific research. Um, when I was a librarian, I didn't really know that data librarianship was a thing. Um, it's emerged a lot more in recent years. And something I found um, before I got my current job is that NACGD or this archive has been around since 1978. Um, the US Department of Justice was very forward thinking about how they wanted to handle crime and justice data, partially because of the political structure of the US government. Um, you have multiple states and then localities, and then you have the federal government, and it just created a unique environment where there was a need to aggregate and bring data together to support the research community. And rather than the federal government building it in one location, what they chose to do is they worked with the University of Michigan and ICPSR to build it. Um, if you visit this URL at the bottom of the screen, it will bring you to my archives webpage, and it contains data going back, um, I believe, over 100 years, if not longer, here in the United States. Um, our popular data collections, there's um, the National Crime Victimization Survey, which covers all crime in the United States, um, and a bunch of other real high-profile data collections as well. But today's presentation's um, going to be kind of informed by that, but a little more broad. It's going to have to do with a short article that I wrote for the Journal of Asso for the uh, Journal of the Association for Information Science and Technology, and I'm going to supplement it by practice-based observations at um, my digital archive of social science research data, and then I'm going to conclude with a quick discussion of open science um, to outline what I'm going to talk about. My presentation is split into three sections. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my paper focused on research data management and the data life cycle. I'm gonna talk about practice-based observations about standards and data documentation. And then I'm gonna conclude my presentation by bringing all these strands together to talk about the real world implications um, of research data management to what I think is the direction that um, scientific and human inquiry is moving in the future. So to talk a little bit about my study, um, a colleague and I, we did a relatively simple study. We interviewed 15 research data managers last year, and they worked at eight data archives in the United States. Uh, we did not look uh, abroad. We were mostly just looking into um, data archives and the infrastructure provided in the US. Um, but we did try to get a good idea of the variety of activity that was going on. We looked at large and small archives, internationally known ones, and also small university repositories. Um, and our goal here was to focus on problems and policy and decision making of people who work in these institutions. And the idea was we wanted to look at problems because everybody talks about RDM, but nobody really talks about the dilemmas and 
the difficulties associated with it and creating rules to figure out how to effectively support uh, research in open science. So what we found is that data managers actually, as, aside from doing just the work you would expect, they have to work as problem solvers tasked with implementing and interpreting policy while they simultaneously, simultaneously manage data. They can rely on policy and rules to guide actions um, and have the experience to address most issues, but about 20% of the time they get stuck they can't fix something or there's some issue that causes things just not to work according to plan. But most interestingly, we heard that problems arise at every stage of the research data life cycle. And these problems in the research data life cycle actually spill over into the research life cycle itself. So they're not neatly separated. Um, the work that goes on and the problems that data archives deal with can impact people trying to reuse data and prevent scientific research from happening, or problems in the research life cycle can spill over into the data life cycle. So it's interwoven, and this idea of open science and open data very much depends on being able to solve the sorts of problems that my colleague and I uncovered in our interviews. This is just a quick overview. It's uh, based off the JISC model of um, research data management and digital curation specifically. It's something that we mentioned in our article. And I'm gonna run through the life cycle and just mention some of the problems that my colleague and I uncovered. And I've seen some of these on the job um, on, at ICBSR as well. Like in one case, we had a data set um, that was including video of classrooms. Um, and the researchers had permission to archive this data and make it available for secondary use with a bunch of restrictions on it. However, when they conducted the study, they forgot to ask for permission from the teachers who were in the classrooms to participate in the study. So it basically slowed up the data deposit process for about a year while they tried to figure out whether it complied with law or not. And this was a minor oversight at the beginning of the study um, that could have easily been resolved. In another case, we spoke with somebody who had questions. Um, they didn't know whether they should accept uh, data into an archive that they thought might be falsified, but they couldn't prove it was because one of the reasons data is supposed to be deposited for this is the possibility of replication studies or reuse in the future. And if there are questions about its accuracy, um, that raise questions about the role of uh, RDM uh, specialist in this case. Um, there was no guidance out there for them. And then the third, there was a case about questions about whether um, software code and the ownership of software could be treated as data. Um, again, here, these archives didn't really have clear solutions. For preservation and storage, we ran into cases where sometimes there wasn't enough funding to deposit data to meet federal policies requiring researchers to deposit data and provide it and make it available. Um, there just wasn't the resources to process as much as was expected. Um, and then there were other cases where there was insufficient storage for large data sets um, when data needed to be deposited. Um, access, use, and reuse was an area where we found most of our dilemmas that caused issues that uh, librarians and data archivists especially ran into issues with. Um, in one case, there was an archive that worked with an academic journal, and they worked together to replicate findings before they were published, even after the peer review process, and the archive could not replicate the findings in the study because they used a proprietary software. And so there were questions about whether the study should be published or not. Um, the peer reviewers said everything was fine, but independently they couldn't go through with the software and check it even though they had the data. Um, balancing data access rules and promoting accessibility is challenging. Uh, there are cases where researchers wanted to share more information than they would were allowed to. And on the other hand, you had researchers who were too cautious and didn't want to share any of their data because they were afraid about confidentiality and privacy concerns. And then complicating matters even more, there were a lot of instances of legacy data sets and policy. Um, essentially, old policies and approaches to research data management um, that gave 
researchers strong incentives to restrict data access and gave them authority to make all decisions about access that didn't really align with open science and data deposit agreements that um, set the terms of use, uh, they were outdated and they created challenges because these archives weren't in a position where they could renegotiate them anymore. It would just be too time consuming to go back and change things, but the law said they had to adhere to things in certain ways. So the main takeaways from the study that I conducted is that not all problems in RDM can be solved with rules. The problems spill over into different stages of the research data life cycle. The uh, data life cycle influences uh, data reuse and open science. And I'm gonna come back to this last point later after I complete the next section of my presentation. So I've talked a little bit about me and where I work. Um, it, it's the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research where I manage a crime data archive. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my observations at ICPSR and we're uh, a very large social science data repository. We're not on the scale that some biomedical repositories are or some other STEM repositories or data archives might be. However, we are arguably one of the largest social science data archives in the world. Um, and working at ICPSR has given me, I think, a really unique perspective on research data management, um, especially at scale and in these big environments. So in the second part of the presentation, I'm really gonna focus on standards and documentation and kind of connect them to what I've talked about and then wrap up by talking about open science. As I think everybody here already knows, standards are, are a way of um, getting data archives and data managers to provide data and especially metadata in uniform formats. And it allows scientists to work together. And there are a lot of different types of standards, but what I'm gonna focus on today is what I see at ICPSR. And this is all anecdotal, of course. There are limitations to my generalizations, but let's assume that data is central to open science and keep that in mind as I go through and talk about standards and documentation. So at ICPSR, we adhere to something that's called the Data Documentation Initiative, and it's a standard for describing study level information. So it um, treats data sets almost like a book or a movie or a single object. It doesn't necessarily break it down into individual data points, although it does allow for the description of individual variables. And DDI, as it's called, and metadata standards make data description possible. It makes it machine actionable and web friendly. It can apply to code books, the data lifecycle, and across domains. And there are a lot of benefits to metadata standards. Uh, my archive has them. Most, most institutions have them in some form, but it basically creates the potential to describe data in a uniform way across archives. It improves data discovery. It allows the creation of federated search tools or single point search tools. And it allows the export of metadata and data from one archive to another. So as a case in point, oh, I used, um, it's called DCAT. I use this standard and DDI to export um, my archives metadata from ICPSR to a federally run website called data.gov managed by the US federal government. And data.gov is a, um, it's an online catalog of, I wouldn't say all, but it's an attempt to catalog almost all of the data sets the US government creates. And the truth of the matter is the US government um, creates more information than it knows what to do with. There's just so much of it that's out there and so many different agencies this is, of course, a large country, as is India, and it creates um, a lot of challenges for data management. So data.gov basically helps to document some of this. And our contribution to it was to show the crime data that is being produced by the Department of Justice. So I used a standard to create this file, and it's super useful. Um, but then there is this question that I would like to pose, and it's whether metadata standards can distinguish between data types, geographic coverage variables in a study, whether a study is freely accessible or whether you have to apply to use it, um, and all of these different information components, though. And I would say the answer is yes. Um, 
but this ties into a project I'm working on now, and I'm looking at search behavior to prototype a recommendation system. And what I keep finding is that everybody I speak to, all the trace data logs I look at, all, all the evidence seems to point that um, searching for data is very difficult. Um, there's a bit of information overload because the needs associated with data are highly specific and they aren't necessarily the same as they might be when you're just searching for a book or something that's at the higher level. Um, describing data in a standard way is of course great, but it takes time to search through the information and to find very specific variables with very specific geographies, geographic coverage and time periods that are covered with certain permissions that you might wanna use and that's a little harder um, it's much more granular so like when you look for a book you know what's on a topic but when you look for a data set what are you really looking for are you looking for a variable or are you looking for a particular variable for a certain period of time it's much 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 more granular and part of research is actually clarifying your data needs to answer questions and so I would argue in this case, standards, they're good at describing things, but actually spending the time to sort through everything that's described is really difficult, um, especially when you have something like data that is much more granular. So this is a, it's, it's a pyramid. I learned about this in graduate school, but it basically places data as the foundation of information, which produces knowledge, which produces wisdom. And if you think about data search from this perspective, it suddenly makes sense why data is harder to find, harder to search through, because there's just so much of it. Now, there are benefits to other types of standards, though. Um, standards for file formats are particularly useful. You know, data can be saved as CSV files and R files and SPSS, and this can promote reuse. But which one do you choose? Um, this is a challenge that my team deals with often. And then content standards, for example, can make data more usable. Um, colleagues of mine at ICPSR, we find that curated data are much more likely to be used by other people. However, curation and cleaning data costs money. And how do you standardize the organization of things like mixed methods data, or is that even possible? My point here, I think, is that standards are particularly useful, but making them work for data in all circumstances to have a nice even flow when it comes to RDM can be particularly challenging. And so you have to almost pick and choose your battles and understand when they work well and when there are gonna be breakdowns. Now, when there are breakdowns, something else I've observed at work is that documentation is especially useful for data. And the primary aim of documentation is to allow others to know things about data sets. So improved documentation can feed into standards and inform later use by researchers. And codebooks are a default way of providing documentation about data sets. And in my archive, uh, all our studies are curated and documented with codebooks. We list the variables, we list uh, frequency tables, background information about how everything's collected. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, we can't document everything. So why have I been talking about standards and documentation when I first started talking about problems in the research data life cycle? Well, there's this increased interest um, in the US and Europe and internationally, I would say, um, about making data fair. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And there are also funder mandates increasingly to archive data sets uh, to promote openness and transparency in research. And open data is arguably central to open science or open research. And what my experience suggests based off standards and documentation and honestly some other areas is that um, even when data are accessible, as my team often makes them, standards and improved documentation alone are not likely enough to maximize reuse. So this is a, uh, a study in my archive and you'll notice that it has been online since 2005, um, but it goes back to 1984 and 1985, and we've had 45 downloads and that's it, and no publications of it. Sometimes data just doesn't get used. Um, and 
truthfully, like when you're trying to increase reuse, there are questions about what needs to be done to reuse it and why, whether you have the resources to support all data equally. And, and that's a challenge. And it's something to think about the implications for in terms of open science, which refers to the movement to make scientific research, including publications, data, physical samples, and software, and its dissemination accessible to all levels of society, amateur or professional. And the term, it's somewhat of a buzz term or buzzword, but it describes multiple ways about thinking about knowledge creation and scholarly communication. How do we create knowledge um, as human beings? How do we share it? How do we communicate bits and pieces of information with one another to speed up scientific progress. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, it has to do with ways of thinking about how to make this process more open and more effective. And so there are schools of thought. There's the infrastructure school that focuses on tools and infrastructure. There's the measurement school, the public school, which focuses on making things public or open the democratic school and the pragmatic school. And I'm not really gonna get into what all these different schools are according to the literature, but um, they're unified by a common desire on the part of researchers to share and pool information and resources. And this is rooted in the idea of collaboration or collective action, which means that researchers in India and in Europe and North America and South America um, even though they may not talk to one another, they are engaging with different bodies of work and different data sets and literature that finds ways to allow somebody somewhere to answer some question that has not yet been answered. And basically open science, when you really think about it, kind of goes all the way back to this idea of a modern academic journal, which is a mechanism that is used to communicate uh, findings that researchers find. So why is open science a big thing now? Well, the open access movement, for example, was driven by the cost of journals. Some journals are extremely expensive in STEM. Um, there's something called the replication crisis, which means that fundamental studies in certain fields haven't been replicable. Um, and without data available to retest certain results and chances to recreate these studies, we don't know if they're actually empirically true or not. In some countries, there's reduced funding to collect research from traditional funders. Um, the internet has changed a lot of things and so has information technology and all of these have created a melting pot, a, a constellation of incentives to push for change. So what's the role of data in this and how does this connect to everything I brought up earlier? Well, uh, there's this idea of the data deluge, which isn't particularly new, but we are living in an era where there's an abundance of information, um, however you may define that. Data is no different. There is an incredible wealth of data available to researchers in all academic fields, uh, from the hard sciences to the social sciences to the humanities. And public access to data allows for the reproducibility of studies that can validate prior work. And data also facilitates secondary use to create entirely new findings. So if I collect a data set and I make it available and one of you decided to use it, you might be able to come up with an idea that I hadn't even thought of and contribute to knowledge by using it. And so the idea is that open data expedites scientific progress, and of course it has other uses to society. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring this up and just kind of wrap up what I'm presenting about today and kind of mention the ecology piece, which I haven't really talked about so far. And ecology is defined as the study of the relationships between organisms and their environment. So do you remember the title of my talk? Um, I mentioned how academics sometimes like having big, long, wordy, important sounding titles that describe what they're talking about. Well, in this case, I think one of the main takeaways from what I've discussed today, both in the paper I mentioned and my observations on the job at ICPSR is that there's, there's value in taking an ecological view of the research data life cycle and the research life cycle uh, 
when trying to understand and advance open science. So what that means for research data management is I demonstrated that problems can't always be solved by rules, at least based off what I've seen. And sometimes these problems can cascade throughout the entire data life cycle, and this creates issues for researchers downstream. Um, in short, no open data, no open science. If research data managers can't solve problems and make data available, and if researchers can't deposit their data, and if the cycles are basically broken, if they are not interrupted, and if there aren't ways to actually continue this work, um, it causes problems for other people who ha aren't even related to it, at least, you know, right away. Um, some cases, these issues may be overlooked, um, but in those cases, it also may be that there are opportunity costs, problems that arise from research not done because you know of issues with data sets not being made available. Uh, likewise, I also talked about standards and data documentation, and I more or less showed to an extent that data standards alone can't fix discovery. Um, when we're overloaded, it's very difficult to parse through all the different descriptive fields associated with data sets. And they can't address all issues associated with usability and file formats and documentation is time consuming to create. So what I would argue, what I would posit is that the research data life cycle and the research life cycle are ecological in that data creation, data archiving, research data management and reuse all depend on relationships between multiple entities, funders, journal uh, editors, journals, um, research data managers, scientists, graduate students. And open data is one part of open science. And while you can't understand and look at very discrete small pieces of this collaborative enterprise, at the end of the day, when you're talking about data, there are these cascading relationships throughout everything. And because even though data is just one part of open science, it is a very important part. And the reasons for this are that it feeds into replication, secondary use, and more. Um, acknowledging relationships between data creators, providers, and users while trying to make data fair, um, I think will be very important moving forward to make open science at least as it's been envisioned by some people to be more successful. And I think a failure to acknowledge the interdependency of relationships um, when it comes to research of this type means that others are likely to be impacted. Um, I can't speak outside of the social sciences in my own narrow domain, which is you know part of the United States, um, but I can say that Data archiving in a lot of fields here is really underfunded. Uh, crime and criminology in the US is one exception to the rule, um, but a lot of other disciplines don't support it. They'll make you write a data management plan, but they won't necessarily support the funding of um, data curation to support researchers, um, which means in practice, people don't necessarily deposit their data or with an archive, or if they do, it's not necessarily usable. So I'd argue collectively, this creates a need for investment in open data on multiple levels to create an ecosystem, um, a true ecosystem where science can truly thrive. And in a sense, that means we're all in this together. So with that said, uh, my name is AJ Million. Thank you so much for listening to me today. If you have any questions, if you'd like to follow up more about my presentation, send me an email. Um, I'd be happy to chat a little bit more, um, especially if it's about crime data. And I hope you have a great rest of the conference. Thank you so much, uh, AJ, for mm -hmm. your wonderful presentation, especially I like the way you connected the dots between the three parts of your presentation. You began with uh, your recent, most recent article based on the survey of the data librarians and their takeaways, and then connected that with your work, the job that you're doing as a director of the archives of the criminal justice data, and then to the
theme of the conference, particularly focusing on standards. I like one takeaway from this talk is that yesterday we have heard people talking about how metadata or standards are the heart and soul of research data management. From a practice point of view, having done that, he says it doesn't fix everything. That's the key, remember. It's important, but it doesn't necessarily fix everything. And the way you connect it to the whole field of open science and the, your plea for more funding in this area. Thank you so much. You know, there is always this, uh, I would say, as an academic, tension between researchers or academics and the practicing library information science professionals. There is this tension, you know, that we are greater because we are doing the work, and so on, where you are only talking theory. But I would say, I would argue that there are two sides of the same coin in one sense, and we need both. We need the academics research, which you have done also. That's how I discovered you. I discovered you through your article in the Journal of um, Association for Information Science and Technology. Then I looked, I said, oh, this here is a guy, because I needed a person or who actually ticks all these boxes. A practicing librarian, a data archivist from the non-STEM areas and who is also done research in this area. So that's, uh, that's the, uh, I would say, the key takeaway here in all respects. That is, we, these are the two sides of the same coin. You need academics or researchers and you need practitioners. So we need to respect each other for the work that they do and the contribute and then push the boundaries and then take things uh, forward. So I would just end this, my conclusion in one sense with the saying there is nothing as practical as a great theory. Thank you so much. Are there any, are you ready? I, I, I must respect your and I thank you for taking time off. It is past midnight there. But despite that, he agreed. You know, I had my own, I said, can you make it? I said, no. He said, I am a night owl. You have proved that you are an night owl. Are there any one or two questions? Yeah, please go ahead. I think you will take. You don't mind, AJ? There is a question here. OK? No, oh, no, of course. Uh, 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 can you hear, sir? I can. Yeah, fine. So uh, congratulations for a very all-encompassing you know, uh, presentation. My question is, uh, for the uh, last three that we are hearing many things. But the first time I am getting a point that you are talking about the finer and granular data retrieval. There is a difference between the text retrieval and data retrieval. In this particular context, don't you think that uh, there should be a relationship between RDM and wiki data? Because in RDM, we are not managing the graph model. So the moment you are making a symbiosis between this or symbolic link between this RDM to wiki data, then retrieval will be much more granular, granular through SparkQL. What is your view on it? Oh, that's a good question. So I haven't worked with Wikidata a whole lot. I had a colleague of mine um, who previously worked at the Wikimedia Foundation who touched on some of it. And in these sorts of situations, I almost inevitably find myself falling back on this idea of redundancy. So I think Wikidata and a lot of the effort that's being done there is very, very useful. Then on the other hand, I like look at the way a lot of my users approach research data management. And they almost kind of take this very non-technical kind of like atomistic way of looking at everything. They aren't really looking for a single source. They just want their data set and that's it. And they want to be able to download it onto their desktop in a CSV file and play around with it in R. Uh, so in a lot of ways, I, this maybe kind of connects back to, I would say my kind of plea for kind of ecological view is that I think these different approaches and these different user communities can coexist, but they're not necessarily identical. Um, I think there's probably different ways of looking at it, and I think redundancy is good. <clears throat> so basically, whatever's being used with Wikidata and being provided there is, is, of course, useful. But then if there are other repositories,
repositories that have it out there that aren't necessarily formatting it in the same way and providing it through the same mechanisms, I think that's fine also, um, just so long as that they're not eating from the same pool of resources and doing unnecessary work. Does that answer your question? Is that is that useful to you? Yes, uh, uh, to some extent. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. There is one other okay. question, uh, Satya. That is Satya Narayana, who is uh, uh, Conclave Chair and the main partner of this organization, Informatics. He is the CMD of Informatics. Yeah, over to you, Satya. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is a well-researched uh, article in the uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is about uh, reusing uh, the data, supplementary data you m mentioned, uh, which could be used for later research by others. Uh, in uh, one of the speakers uh, yesterday spoke about this. Uh, one of the reasons why the researchers do not want to make the data available uh, is when they generate a lot of data, only a small part of the data they may end up using, which they will validate before, and a lot of data they will not even be able to validate. Because they are not able to further validate, they fear that they could be misused or abused or uh, uh, used for wrong reasons or whatever. So in effect, there it's a data that is not validated by them for somebody else's usage. This is one of the reasons. Now. Uh, how do you address this issue of making available all the data that researcher deposits for uh, reuse and uh, avoid this kind of situation of uh, using supplementary data which is not validated, uh, which may be misused or abused? Uh, thank you. Oh, I appreciate the question and that's a really uh, it's a tricky thing to answer. I can tell you what my archive does. So we run into issues where people get worried about the use of crime statistics in the United States for ideological purposes. They're not necessarily interested in kind of drawing scientific inferences. They, they want to make some point. And so what we do is to kind of balance this tension, um, the data is archived and put into the repository and there's an application process to use it. Um, so basically all studies um, that are funded by the National Institute of Justice, they automatically are required to be deposited into our archive. To receive all of the grant money, there's a piece of the grant that is withheld until the very end that is not provided until it is actually deposited and then it is given them. So that's the teeth that, that makes them give the data. Now, just because the data has been deposited doesn't mean that it's actually available for reuse. Um, it's put into a system. There's an evaluation process that we have on the back end where we essentially go through it and look for identifiers and we look at basically its use. And there's an evaluation process on the Department of Justice's end as well. So that's when we go through, we clean it up, we look at what's available. And so there's some curation that actually goes into the process. And then we make a decision about how it's provided. Um, we can't control for all misuse and that's not really our job to be gatekeepers, but we can manage for the most egregious cases. So for example, we have some data that relates to prisoners and involves their identities. Um, it also involves uh, instances of violence within prisons. And so we don't want this to be made public. Um, it's an important thing to study, but we have to kind of make sure it's looked at properly. So the actual application process has to describe methodologies, the justification for using it. Um, we can't just have random people off the public who aren't credentialed just access the data. They have to go through a vetting process. So we do that as well. I'm not sure if that model is replicable in every single instance. And I think that's really one of the challenges in RDM is finding what cases you want to have a really controlled approach that kind of looks over people's shoulders to make sure that they're doing the right methodologies and the data is cleaned and the cases where it's okay just to make things open because the risk of misuse isn't very high. 
Um, but in my case, at least in criminology, that's the approach that we've taken. And I can say it's pretty useful. We really don't see much misuse of the data. Um, in the cases where I think it happens, I will say that I think that the field also does a reasonable job of policing itself as well. So even if they are able to take the data, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get it peer reviewed in a high end journal, um, which helps too. Now, does that stop for, you know, fake news and sensationalist headlines and stuff like that online? I don't know, but if, if I can solve that, I would be a very rich man. <laughs> and I unfortunately don't have a solution yet. Yeah, my question as already stated, uh, is uh, nothing facet analysis is nothing but the concept analysis in any uh, domain. Uh, so when you say the standards cannot fix data discovery, it is perhaps uh, the capability of uh, or intelligence of mm, uh, formulating queries by uh, uh, identifying the dormant uh, concepts of the theme. If that is the situation, uh, how do you justify your statement? Particularly, maybe one example I can make is uh, mm -hmm. the uh, the uh, forensic jurisprudence, mm -hmm. where uh, the data concepts are uh, more closer to the uh, uh, scientific uh, terminology and conceptual uh, approach. Mm -hmm. If that is the case, how do you react to the situation? Okay, I, th I think I understand what you mean by this. Um, I, I think computational methods and different ways of classifying content um, does a really great job, like, and moves us a long way towards, like, improving discoverability. Um, and I don't mean to say that standards aren't a good thing. I think they very much are. Um, I guess what I was saying is that it's ultimately an issue of documentation and that at a certain point, humans tend to run into information overload. So I'm kind of looking at this from a behavioral perspective. So if you're ever looking at long, long, long strings of text and lots of description, you can find better ways to narrow in and kind of get people what they want. And right now, at least, we don't seem to have the infrastructure, the systems available that can really maximize um, this information in a way that kind of distills things down in a way that people can process and make decisions about. Um, that That's more along the lines of what I was trying to get at here. Um, I might be wrong in the long term, um, but at least in the context that I'm dealing with um, in terms of the systems that ICPSR and the data discovery systems that I've worked with, they have these different metadata schemas that describe all these different facets of these data sets. And you can analyze them and look through them, but there's just so many of them that manually we run into problems. Um, our minds just get overloaded and it takes too long. Computationally, I think there are better ways to do that. And I think that's the way things are going moving forward. And that's actually an area that I'm not an expert in. Um, so. I think standards in that sense, maybe in the future, they can help us in ways that I haven't envisioned, but at least as things are now just uniformly describing things alone, I don't think that's enough. I think it's going to be more a matter of computation and figuring out how to tease information out and distill it down and boil it down in a way that people can understand and kind of get what they need out of it. Um, so that's that's the direction I was going. I didn't necessarily to make it into a black and white, hard and fast statement that standards are bad or anything like that. It was more of a, in this current situation, the way the infrastructure that I've worked with at ICPSR, it's, it's had these limitations just because that's the systems we're dealing with and people get overloaded, if that makes, if that makes sense. Now I would like to invite the anchor of our session, Professor Parthasati Mukhopadhyay, to come over and start the session. Our panelists for this session are Dr. G. Mahesh, with the CSIR, whom we have already seen and heard as anchor uh, in a previous session, 
and we another panelist is Dr. Satish Manoli of the Tata Memorial Center. And then the third panelist is Dr. Anup Kumar Das of Center for Science Policy, School of Social Sciences, JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Welcome you all and over to you now. So uh, uh, you already know that uh, today's topic morning session is research life cycle data management and standards. And uh, uh, you already know what is what uh, from the million speech. I would like to start from Mahesh uh, to comment on certain things because till in this age of data revolution, we cannot separate research publication from the data set. So still a uh, data set and research journals are inseparable from each other. And uh, you know, rich experience of Mohes in the domain of uh, journal editing, science publication. So I would like uh, a view from, uh, for, from him that we are now uh, uh, you know, uh, getting uh, re, uh, you know, information and news about different kind of new formats of journal, like video abstract, like data journals. So I, I, I think as a library professionals, we need to know uh, this con emerging concept of data journal, video abstracting, and many such new things happening. And uh, who can throw a light better than uh, Dr. G. Mohes, uh, you know, who is dealing with all, the, all of these things for the last 15 years. So it's over to you, Mohes. Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you, uh, Partha. So uh, before I answer your question, I'll come to the answer. So uh, when the session started this morning, when uh, Professor Shalini took the stage, she spoke, said that uh, yesterday we spoke about research data management, um, uh, you know, life cycle, uh, research data life cycle rather, and today we are talking about research um, life cycle. And in fact, um, and about the overlap she had mentioned. And in fact, uh, Dr. AJ also, uh, when he started off his talk, he uh, spoke about how each of these, the research uh, life cycle and the research data life cycle, uh, spill into uh, each other. Uh, now, um, uh, but then if you look at the life cycles of both, you, you will find some uh, commonalities, isn't it? And also some differences. So in the typical research life cycle, we are talking about, uh, you know, identifying a problem, collaborators, uh, you know, uh, review of literature, methodology, uh, then, um, you know, doing the analysis, publishing, and so on. I mean, not in the exact order, but then loosely that. And when you talk about the research data life cycle, we are, uh, you know, right from planning, then, you know, data gathering, processing, uh, and, um, you know, preservation, sharing, okay, and so on, you know, uh, reuse and all that. Now, the two words that I would like to focus in each of these life cycles, in the research cycle, we use the word publishing, right? And in the research data life cycle, we use the word sharing. Now, uh, you know, this is important in the sense that, you know, I remember when uh, we, uh, uh, during at the peak of COVID, when we were doing a tweet in CSIR, we mentioned, you know, CSIR is uh, at the forefront of the COVID-19 battle. And this was tweeted. We thought, I thought, you know, it was a very simple tweet because I had done the tweet. And uh, there was immediately comment on uh, Twitter saying that, how can you use the word uh, the metaphor uh, battle, uh, or likewise, you know, when uh, India and the so and so country match, we say you know, it's the war. Then how can you use a war metaphor for a cricket match? So these terminologies, publishing and sharing, uh, you know, uh, we we need to look at that. Now, when the uh, publishing and sharing in research life cycle and research data life cycle were used, we did not probably think that there would be a time when the first research data journal that you're talking to uh, came about in 2008. By 2015, we have about 15 exclusive research data journals. And uh, today, we have about 25 research data journals and uh, more than 100 mixed journals which publish both research data and uh, research papers. Now, this brings about a new dimension. Because yesterday, I think uh, Dr. Vishwanath was mentioning about uh, data journals. And he, we, uh, we also discussed you know, in different sessions about incentivizing uh, researchers. And as you rightly said, uh, there are so many new types of journals that have uh, come about. In fact, in the keynote, uh, in, the, in the informatics lecture, we heard about archives being a new platform, uh, faculty of 1000 being a new you know, possible platform that is an alternative to the research journals that we have known for more than 350 years now. Uh, 
Uh, but then we also should remember that in the last 20 years, there has been churning in the learning uh, in the, the journal publishing landscape. As you rightly said, very many new types of journals, the mirror journals, the data journals, the visual journals, and so on and so forth has uh, come into being. They have come into being. So um, uh, research data journals, uh, when we uh, talk about, uh, also go through, uh, these are questions that need to be asked. Should it also go through the same uh, process that a research paper publishing goes through, you know, uh, the peer review. Should be the same kind of peer review? Uh, or what would be the differences uh, between the, uh, you know, research paper peer review and the research data paper uh, peer review? So, uh, but then, uh, uh, given the problems that we have in uh, research data management, or I can say the concerns that we have in research, uh, data, um, you know, management. Uh, research data journals are an important medium to be uh, looked at. Yeah, I think this is enough for the opening remarks. Then, yeah. in, in this context, I have another question to you. Are you planning any uh, such kind of journal? In the, uh, is it in the pipeline? Anyone? Of you? Uh, at least not to my knowledge. Again, yesterday there was a talk about. In fact, again, I uh, to. I refer to Professor Shalini uh, talking about introduction of a new journal and how one of them said that we don't uh, need a journal. I, this is a view that I slightly uh, differ from. Uh, or after all, we know that quality leads to, uh, sorry, sorry, quantity uh, leads to quality. So we can and should have more and more journals. Some journals would wither away. Uh, some would, uh, you know, flourish. Uh, yes, we can think about uh, having, uh, you know, we should have all these different uh, uh, platforms, be it research journals, be it, uh, you know, repositories, uh, institutional repositories, or subject repositories, or data repositories. I have all this, you know, some of them may wither away, some uh, would, uh, um, you know, flourish. So, uh, the, uh, to my knowledge, there is no plan in India uh, about uh, starting a new uh, data journal, but then it, it is not a bad idea. Thank you. <clears throat> So uh, you see here uh, from uh, his answers that everything is fluid actually. You are there and we are here, there is no actually no difference. We also uh, cannot view the horizon, presently it's an emerging field. Uh, when I was coming from the uh, hotel to this uh, venue, uh, I came with a madam and she nicely said uh, that every time for the last three days you are talking about the problems, where is the solution? Give us some solution. Okay, so I am now handing uh, this uh, with this great responsibility uh, the microphone over uh, to my friend Dr. Satish Munali from Tata Memorial uh, Center, and he will be talking about uh, different aspect of health data management. What you people are doing, and how you are managing data. What is the speciality of health data sets? How it how does it differ from other scientific and social science data sets? So, uh, please, sir. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, LTC, uh, Professor Chalniars, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Satyanarana and uh, Dr. Vaidande for inviting me for this uh, uh, discussion, an interesting uh, topic, research life cycle, data management and standards. Since I'm just coming from the Cancer Research Institute, basically it is in the life science and health science, I would be, my perspectives and observations would be more from that angle. So when we are just uh, talking about the research uh, life cycle in the uh, life sciences or health sciences, it is a continuous uh, process from in various uh, labs, like uh, generating the data through the various experiments and empirical observations, or even using the uh, slides uh, below the microscope, or even uh, experiment, conducting the experiments on the, uh, on the small animals, and also generating the data uh, of the protein sequences or gene sequences. A lot of data is generated in various labs from various uh, set of people, uh, basically from the student's point of view or even the principal investigators as well as, uh, uh, what you can say, research associates. They all will be just generating the data for a kind of a objective or a kind of a, uh, uh, wherein the project is just uh, uh, taking a lead to derive a kind of a solution to a problem. My point of view is like, when you are generating so much of data and also 
even any kind of a data when it is generated for uh, basically for publishing it in an uh, international journal and when they themselves are not so comfortable with the kind of a data what they have generated and which is a huge and maybe they have to just again clean the data and standardize the data before even just coming out with a kind of a table or even a kind of a uh, image set of images for just analyzing the data how best they can just use the entire data to just uh, take forward to address some of the queries on the project so uh, i i really uh, i'm not very sure how this kind of a data management uh, is going to take a lead in the institutional level or even in the national level when we are just developing a database in this institutional or national level and who are the users basically and whenever even if you look at the kind of a uh, submitting any manuscript to a particular journal it goes through a lot of a peer review process and when you are just talking about the data which is very raw in general otherwise it is just being cleaned or filtered only for the research project purpose and whether the researcher community is really just going to share that kind of a data to archive in a kind of a institutional uh, archive system or database management system whether in the institutional level or in the national level and i really uh, find it a very challenging uh, task for the uh, professionals who are just going to handle this research uh, data uh, first of all they should agree because whatever the data they generate basically it is just being used for their own research activities and even sometimes i feel that even the next lab uh, investigators or researchers also may not just uh, get the data what the uh, lab people are generating the uh, data from their uh, research projects and uh, uh, one more thing i would like to share here is like uh, in the international or even the in the general publishing industry what i observed re uh, in the recent especially in the life sciences what i just observed along with the manuscript of the research the publishers are also editorial team is also asking for the data sets so one of the ways at the present scenario in the publishing industry what i observe reasonably the publishing industry is just managing the data at the back end especially in the life sciences and health sciences what my observation and also i just do receive a request from the publish uh, that uh, our scientific community is saying that apart from the article i just wanted the uh, data which is there in the supplements and the images so reasonably i would say that the publishing industry is managing but i don't know how it is just going to uh, uh, kind of a take a shape or a structure or when you are just uh, developing a, a database at the institutional level or even in the country level so this is a big question uh, for me uh, to just to uh, address and uh, the basic generator of the data is like the scientific community and whether they are really ready to share because even while submitting the manuscript to the uh, publishers they are just submitting their copyrights also to the publishers and also one more aspect i would like to uh, say like if we are talking about anything and everything in the open access platform in the open science you have seen the article processing charge uh, apc is a concept whether as in a similar way dpc also may come data processing charges so these are some of the thoughts i just thought of uh, submitting from my end thank you sotis uh, uh, let me share uh, my one of my uh, experience with data sharing uh, recently i published uh, a huge data uh, data intensive paper in igi global in a book and uh, they requested me that you upload your data into genedo generate a dui kind of thing you upload your figures in fix here and link your caption with that particular uh, you know uh, url created by fixier so this kind of public data repository are available and publishing houses which are basically a profit making agency they are taking help of this kind of public uh, you know uh, data repository but not investing anything uh, uh, you know in developing their own data repository and making them publicly accessible so with this uh, i will be coming to uh, touch upon the third facet of this session that is the data standard and uh, uh, dr ag already clearly said that uh, data standards we can consider at three level at the file format level what we are going to upload second is the content level there comes the role of metadata and 
finally at the retrieval level, and in which particular format we are opening it. Directly you are getting data in CSP and opening in CSP is not going to lead us anywhere. You need to retrieve data. For example, I'm asking you one question here. All uh, seasoned library professionals are here. That please give me a list of Indian politicians born after 1970. As a library professional, it's a cakewalk for you to give me that list within 10 minutes. But if I ask you a question, give me a list of Indian politicians whose either parent was or is also a politician. Do you have any known source for it? There comes the role of a public data repository like Wikidata. We can make a very simple pipeline uh, Spark UL, and we can get that data, uh, data ready in JSON format or in graph format. So with this, I will be <laughs> coming to my friend. And I forget to mention, but uh, Mohe started a game uh, in the <laughs> you know, very fast day. A train, finding a train of characteristics in the uh, panel setup. Then uh, Professor Salini also you know, <laughs> uh, played that particular game. So let me play uh, this game before I am going to Anup. That here, three panelists, there is uh, one uh, you know, train of characteristics that we belong to the same alma mater. And uh, the first question I made uh, to Satish to this morning, are you anywhere related to Instock? So he said a big no. Otherwise, we can have a fine train of characteristics. So uh, uh, I'm going to Anuf, uh, who is uh, my junior, and uh, Mohesh is my senior. So di directly, I'm in between. So what do you think about that view of uh, AJ, that file format standard, metadata standard, and retrieval standard? You please. Uh, First, I would like to thank uh, Professor Salini and uh, Mr. Sutanarno for inviting me to this August gathering and also uh, getting uh, many new information, new knowledge about the research data management. And uh, I work with the social science department, so where we have both the qualitative data as well as quantitative data. And we know that uh, our uh, students are mostly going to the fields and they are collecting data, uh, uh, qualitative data like anecdotes of the respondents like uh, they are interviewing uh, the women scientists and asking uh, what motivates them to come to the STEM research and also kind of uh, oral histories of uh, different participants of the uh, people science movement and uh, like that, and uh, so they generate two kinds of data sets. One is quantitative, that is uh, age, income, education level, and this kind of data sets, and also that uh, quantitative, uh, qualitative data sets, which includes all the uh, anecdotal uh, information. So for that, uh, uh, actually there are certain interoperability issues where we can see that uh, we have uh, different kind of data structure, data structure, metadata st uh, standard, as well as data structure of individual files. So, so how to incorporate that? And uh, they are using uh, certain uh, standards based on social science practices. And also, mm -hmm. there are issues of uh, interoperability because they want to retrieve the data from different data sources. and. We see that uh, uh, there are many levels of interoperability, like uh, we have zero uh, level where there is no interoperability, and there is uh, level one, which, which is technical interoperability, where uh, technical end-to-end -end exchange of data among the systems are happening. And then we have uh, synthetic uh, interoperability, where uh, exchange of data uh, information through predefined data format and structure. Here we have kind of uh, qualitative and quantitative data structure. And then semantic interoperability where we are inserting the same meaning of the exchange data through predefined and shared meaning of terms and expression where uh, you talked about the uh, knowledge graphs. Uh, so those uh, concepts uh, take uh, 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 gives help to the researchers when they are retrieving data from different data sources as well as when they are uh, self-archiving data to uh, like Genodo and other other places. Uh, 
repositories. And also, uh, as a uh, facilitator, I also help them to uh, uh, how, how to that uh, structure the data as well as how to self archive and how to collect the data from different data sources. Like you are talking about data journalism, mm -hmm. so uh, there are certain avenues for that journalism, uh, like uh, India Spain and India Data Portal. Also, they are pro providing different kind of insights of uh, rural. Uh, development and also Indian economy. So this kind of uh, data are also being utilized by uh, social science researchers in, in our department, also in our school. So that's why uh, we promote our uh, research data management in the social science departments. Oh, thank you. Okay, uh, very nicely you know, uh, uh, presented. Now, uh, you see here there is a difference between the STEM data, science, technology, engineering, and management or medicine, and the social science data. Most of the cases, a data set directly, in case of STEM, data set directly related to a publication. And in case of social science, most of the cases, a paper originated from an available data set. For example, your census data set, your NSSO data set, and so on and uh, the data set what Anup mentioned. But uh, uh, that uh, particular question of madam is uh, you know, haunting me right from the morning that what is the solution and you are always talking about problem. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm uh, taking this privilege to break the rule of presentation slightly. Uh, I already took permission, although half-heartedly, uh, from uh, the conference director that I will try to show one particular snapshot to make it clear that what may be the solution. So may I request Devendra to come to my last, last but one slide. For example, you see here when you are talking about data standard. Data standard means availability of data in a format which you can query. And query in a finer sense, what Dr. Ajay said, in a more granular way. So what is happening in our own domain, bibliographic data, you know, data set? We are also uh, producing a lot of five-star data. Five-star data means your data available as a linked open data so that other people can use it. So if I come to uh, this particular you know, uh, option, you see here, it's a book you all know, The Wings of Fire. Okay, so what we are, we actually did one experiment. We took the entire library of Congress subject heading list. It is available in .nt format. That's a RTF triple. And we converted that through an uh, open source software called Scosify to convert that NT data into .ttl data. So .ttl is a more readable, you know, RDF triple format. Then we train a particular language model by using the TF-IDF and Omikuzi. Omikuzi is a language model that this is my vocabulary and this is my trained data set, almost one million uh, you know, Library of Congress subject heading uh, encoded data set I fed into that particular model. And you see what is the result. If, you, if I encode this particular data and take this particular abstract or blurb from this, from this book, and if, if you go, go to the next, okay. So this is the uh, final project. We have taken NCSE as a vocabulary as, and we are feeding that particular text related to that document and it can automatically generate, you know, different kind of related heading. Not all are still hitting the bullseye, but you see it can identify it's a juvenile literature, it can identify it's a biography. It's a small baby step towards this data science and you can see that if data made available openly, what miracle we can do with our library profession. Now you think this particular model, if we can integrate with DC dot subject in case of our, uh, you know, any data repository. So by uh, reading the title and the abstract or the full text of the document, it can rightly predict that these are the possible subject heading list. And when you are opening this for crowdsourcing, a seasoned librarian may not possibly need it, but when you are opening it for crowdsourcing, the beautiful help they are getting uh, to pick up the DC dot subject. In most of the cases, you all are library professionals here, you know the most wrong data people entered in DC dot subject. And there comes our value to rectify 
uh, to you know uh, modify that particular one so uh, if you want to uh, uh, make any comment further comment you are welcome we have uh, how much two minutes no fast sir final comment onu one announcement that is uh, we have one new journal that is called uh, data science uh, informatics and uh, citation studies so it will include the data papers also okay, so fine. so yeah you going to publish yeah actually uh, there is one journal called uh, journal of scientific research and uh, this is the sister journal of that journal Uh, journal, uh, journal of Data Science, Informatics, and uh, Citation Studies. So uh, it will be published from India. So for each yeah. and every paper, you will be having your data paper. Yeah. So you already prepared your data in some place. No, no, no. It is in the in yeah the in the in the pipeline. So okay, uh, then uh, we are at dot eleven. So thank you very much. So I now invite a few questions from the audience of Mission Enthusiasm. Bangalore. Yeah, so uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, more than a question. I think uh, something. I think I felt that, like, when it comes to the metadata, data management, because this is very core to my area. And uh, so, with my little knowledge, with these several years of experience, I think uh, uh, when we say standard, that leads to something different. because you need metadata you i think uh, it's very bad i mean unfortunately we are not getting this keynote speaker of this session see when i say standard i think it's refers to that where majority of the people use that because how something becomes standard it's the thing that people everyone the community start using it they refer it for whatever the reason maybe nothing is there so everyone and there we are all very lazy and whatever is available let us grab it and use it so over the time then some standard organization like iso or say for example community driven like dublin core or say rda kind of these kind of community driven or w3c they enter into there and they say that okay we are recommending and in that way something becomes a standard so the standards are not necessarily to be sufficient to you know uh, to to you know suffice your requirement but the thing is that it doesn't mean that that we actually you know the metadata for example for sake uh, is not uh, you know is not the solution i think this metadata is the solution but i would differ to say that metadata standard i would say only metadata as i mentioned in the previous sessions that we need metadata and these are whatever ddi that data documentation initiative or say for example data cube or say for example even the dcat so these are all the different metadata you know vocabulary site refer them as a vocabulary so they are there but the things that they are not sufficient and that is obvious reason because science is something that is cannot be said that set and over this is like a continuation and it's an incremental process so over time we have to each of us have to contribute we have to come out with the things but i still believe it metadata is the solution and then coming to the next point that interoperability it's a of course as the uh, speaker very rightly said that syntactic and semantical so when that semantic uh, interoperability comes basically that is where that ontology that graph basically basically the semantic ontology that comes into that picture so here again you know uh, what i feel uh, this is my personal uh, again experience that semantic inter interoperability even is very expensive actually it's very expensive so the thing is that again for that the solution is the metadata so what i want to emphasize that metadata is the solution if you look at the rda what is that rda is it's nothing but the metadata data model this is exactly they have copied our library you know that cataloging system that where you have the subject you have the descriptors you have the values that is what exactly the rda is that's the most simplest you know form of the rda right so that's the data model right so whatever we do we need that metadata that's a very simplified but it's very powerful structure and that's i still believe that we can solve all the problems with the metadata only thing is that we need that when we talk about the semantic interoperability i think we need the other mechanisms like we are saying that ontology is one of the possible the best 
uh, at present is available solution. Yeah, I mean, thank you. I quite uh, completely agreed with you that in the library domain, you see all the standards we are having can be categorized into two groups. Either it's a de jure standard or it's a de facto standard. So fortunately, right from the beginning, except UDC, nobody actually applied for this ISO recognition. So most of the standards we follow in the domain of library are de facto standards. You, you take any standard. It's basically voluntary standard, de facto standard. And uh, I will try to, uh, you know, so will differ slightly with you one point that metadata is not the solution for everything. Let me, let me you know, uh, give you one particular uh, concept. Say, how granular you can make a metadata so that it can retrieve very, you know, uh, in a granular query from the user end. It's not quite possible every time you can guess the requirement of a user. Metadata should also learn during the time because you see Dublin course started with 13 elements. Now it is 22. So it learned actually all the years that what are the data elements are missing. So it's a process of learning. Nothing you can say it's 100% true. As I said that we are all confused and we are happy that we are sharing or we are present uh, during the emergence of, of a new subject called RDM. And possibly within uh, next uh, three to five years, it will be part of the LIS curricula everywhere in the country. So with this... Uh, uh, One online question is there. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, my specific question is to Mr. Satish. Uh, well, is there a consortium mechanism in India uh, in the life sciences critical data consolidation and sharing? on policy formulation stage and also uh, to the public. Because as of now, there is a, a, a shift in the publication of data, initially as part of the journal articles. Uh, uh, many publishers have adopted that as already indicated. But beyond that, it is going to create a situation where we need to have a kind of a exclusive data centers in specific areas in such a context. Uh, I'm repeating the question, is there a, a, a consortium mechanism now operational in the highest level uh, uh, on critical data in life sciences, uh, incorporating major role players in the country? Uh, you mean to say that the uh, consortia kind of archives wherein the researchers can just deposit their uh, data? In that way, you, your question is? Uh, no, you are you are answering that you are guessing, getting queries from different uh, 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 users uh, who read the articles yeah. wherein some select data is available, and you are supposed to and uh, you are trying to just provide more data to such uh, uh, authors or such, uh, those who are demanding such things to standardize that to create some kind of a uh, a system facility in a wider perspective whether ICMR or uh, your institute and other IGIB and other agencies who are the stakeholders in the life sciences critical data are having some kind of a mechanism to share and filter out what is required to be kept as highly confidential and what can be shared uh, among the general public. Right. What, uh, this is my observation in context to this life science or health science uh, uh, data sets or kind of uh, images or even the Excel sheets or supplements or supporting documents, they're all a part of the main article which are very much there available with the DOI and DOI is the main key, uh, what you can say, single point source to go to the article then to the supporting documents and uh, sometimes many of the publishers are uh, keeping that supporting documents totally open but the article will be behind the paywall and uh, this is my observation. I just uh, do not uh, see as such any kind of uh, other uh, source wherein uh, the individual scientific community are just allowed to just share that particular uh, 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 standardized data, I would say, to deposit in somewhere in some other source or something. If it is already available in the kind of a, uh, publisher's platform along with the article and that data can be used. Uh, otherwise, I do not uh, see any kind of uh, a separate uh, a database which is managed to uh, uh, deposit such kind of uh, uh, data sets. Decades ago, in the 90s, uh, uh, NIH had a database 
on medical imaging alone exclusive yeah. on medical imaging right yeah, so image data bank is, image data bank is there but i am not really sure about the kind of uh, uh, the submission of the images to that particular data bank wherein uh, the kind of uh, even even the peer review process is there uh, at the back end that's what i understand but what are the standards or the peer reviews understanding about the images i do not still understand the kind of a peer reviewing process of an image how they are just going to uh, just uh, uh, really peer review the kind of uh, images and uh, uh, to accept that kind of uh, uh, image to upload in the uh, image bank uh, it is a kind of a uh, kind of a question for me also to understand how the peer reviews uh, peer reviewers are just evaluating the images uh, uh, at their end thank you all speakers uh, thank you professor parthasarathi mukhopadhyay for anchoring this session on behalf of conclave organizers I request Professor Parthasarathy, Professor Parthasarathy to felicitate Dr. Satish Munoli with a memento. Now I request Professor to felicitate Dr. Anup Kumar Das. Now I request Professor to felicitate Dr. G. Mahesh.